Well, our study for this morning has a phenomenal title to it. And you'll, you might think, well, did he come up with this? <laughs> well, I'll tell you the title, you'll understand. The title of our study is four words, Jesus Christ our Lord. That is a fabulous title, isn't it? Of course, it comes from the Word of God. That is the subject of the Word of God. But it's the subject of our study as well. You may remember the statement that Jesus made in John 16, 14, that the Holy Spirit will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. The ultimate ministry of the Holy Spirit to magnify and glorify the Lord Jesus Christ and take the things that are Christ and declare them to us, those of us who know him and those who need to know him. We're going to look at one of the great passages in Scripture out of 1 Corinthians. One of the great passages in Scripture that in nine little verses just magnify and glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll do three things in this study. We will first consider each aspect of this glorious phrase and title, Jesus Christ our Lord. And second, we'll consider some of the wondrous blessings that are ours, that are related to this glorious phrase, Jesus Christ our Lord. And then the third and last thing we'll consider out of this same passage is what these wondrous blessings depend upon. And I'll give you a tip off of the good news. They don't depend upon us. (laughs) They depend upon a great aspect of God that is drawn out in this passage. Well, before we pray together, let's read this great passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the first nine verses of the book. Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all who in every place call on the name, and here it is, of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you have been enriched in everything by him in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the the end that, you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord, we do pray that as we consider these magnificent few words, all wrapped around the glory and reality of Jesus Christ our Lord, that you will pour out your Holy Spirit, enlightening our hearts and minds, showing us the majesty of Jesus Christ our Lord, and showing us some of the phenomenal, wondrous blessings that are ours in Him. And Lord, we pray for you to build us up in faith and hope and love, and that we might grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord through this great passage of Scripture. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The title, Jesus Christ Our Lord, actually appears four or five times in those nine verses and four or five other times in portions of that great title, Jesus Christ Our Lord. Let's take a few minutes, since this occurs so often through these nine verses, Take a few minutes and just consider each aspect of that glorious phrase, Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus, let's consider that great name. 
It's the name of our Lord. The name of our Lord. It's the New Testament corollary to Joshua in the Old Testament. Joshua, Yeshua. It would be Yesu in the New Testament. And in English, it would be Jesus or Spanish, Jesus. This is a great name. This is a name above all names when applied to Jesus of Nazareth. What, what a name. The name actually means Yahweh is salvation. Yahweh means I am, the great I am. The eternal creator God is salvation. That's the gospel right in one word, and the word is Jesus. There's no other name like it. And it speaks of, of course, this great salvation that is ours. When you hear the name of Jesus, it's about salvation. It says, I am is salvation. The true and living God is salvation. What a great salvation we have. The the merciful, gracious, rescuing work of God on our behalf. That's what's being spoken of in that great name, Jesus. And one way to just take a sweeping uh, glance at it, really, is to think of our great salvation in the terms of from, unto, and through. Salvation applies in those directions. We have been saved from, from sin, from hell, from condemnation, from alienation with God. Saved from self. Saved from futility. And really, the list could go on and on and on. There are a lot of things we're saved from, and every one of them. We can praise and thank the Lord Jesus Christ for that. But we're actually saved unto greater things than we're saved from. We're saved unto righteousness, which is greater than sin. We're saved unto heaven, which in its magnificence is greater than the horrors of hell. We're saved unto justification, you know, declared not guilty, which is greater in magnitude than all the condemnation we rightly had before in ourselves in Adam. We're saved unto identification with Christ himself. No longer is our life defined by ourselves and the futility of the self-life. All of those things we're saved unto in that mighty name of Jesus. But along the way, we can certainly be thankful that we're saved through all kinds of things by our Savior. We're saved through trials. There's no way to live on a sin-scarred, fallen planet with an enemy of our souls and not have trials. (laughs) Everyone has trials. By the way, for some folks, that's an astounding revelation. The enemy likes to keep us isolated as long as he can, believing one of his great lies. He has many. One of his great lies is uh, nobody gets things messed up, troubled, and in so many trials like you do. You know, he wants to give all of us the first prize in that (laughs) and keep it quiet, you know. No, nothing has overtaken you but such as is common to man. But our Savior saves us through, rescues us, delivers us through the trials of life and the testings of life. Often people want to know, this difficulty I'm in, is it a trial or a testing? And almost always it's both. The enemy wanting to tempt us and tear us down in some kind of trial. The Lord wanting to use that very conflict as a testing in our lives to exercise our heart and soul in faith toward the Lord. We get saved through battles, through attacks of the enemy. All of that, from, unto, through, all of it. Just a a quick snapshot, really, of this great salvation, which is all tied into the very name of our Savior, Jesus. 
the great I am, is salvation. No wonder, it's the name above every name, no wonder when you introduce that name in any situation, it just changes things. Have you noticed that it's almost like a lightning bolt, you know? <laughs> you can talk about the uh, uh, Buddha or a sports hero or money or fame or scheming you've got, you know, or boast in yourself or tear down others. You can talk about all kinds of things and people, yeah, 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 yeah maybe even engage with you some, you know. And you say the name of Jesus. It's like... <laughs> Where did that come from? It came from eternity past and heaven above. And it's the name above all names. It's the only name by which we must be saved. What a name. I think we come to love that name the longer we know him and walk with him. Jesus Christ our Lord. And he is the Christ. This Jesus that we follow, he is the Christ. He's the Messiah, would be the term of the Old Testament, which means the anointed one. He's the Father's promised divine king. The one who would bring an everlasting kingdom. And the one who wants to work the reality of that kingdom in and through our lives. You know, those who know the Lord, those to whom Jesus is King and Savior, they're citizens of His kingdom. And the Lord wants to work the reality of that kingdom through our lives. We live in America. That is a kingdom of man. It's an earthly kingdom. Many blessings from God upon it. Many problems, no doubt, As God looks upon us. But there are all kinds of things that pertain to that kingdom, you know. And and when you live in that natural kingdom of man, those impact you for good or bad, for blessing or battle or problem through your life. Well, way more important and more real than that is the kingdom of heaven. And the Lord wants to work this this wonderful everlasting kingdom and all of its realities into our hearts and lives and homes and families and relationships. Jesus, our Savior, He's the Christ, the Anointed One, promised by the Father and by the Spirit upon Him. He came, carried out His mission of purchasing this great salvation. And he wants to establish by the power of his spirit upon our lives the realities of the kingdom. He wants to anoint us. He wants to transform us. He wants to use us. He wants to empower us. He wants to make himself and his ways known in and through our lives while we're here upon this earth. And it happens By the same means that he served on this earth. By the power and work of the Holy Spirit. When we say Jesus, we are talking about this grand, great Savior we have. When we speak about the fact that he's the Christ, we're speaking about an anointed king in our lives with an everlasting kingdom. And our desire to serve him by the power of Of the Holy Spirit. A kingdom where the king is the anointed one is kind of a tip off on how the kingdom is to operate. (laughs) You know? The way it was seen in his life in the Gospels, promised by the prophets of old, elaborated on by the apostles through the New Testament epistles, all of those realities only available by the work of the Holy Spirit. That's how this anointed one wants to work in our lives. He wants to pour out his spirit upon us. Pour out, you know, flood, fill, and overflow our lives with the presence and work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ is also our Lord. 
He's our master. He's our ruler. He's the one that the scriptures teach us actually owns us. You know, people talk about take charge of your life. Hey, wait a minute. We don't have a life anymore. We don't own one to take charge of. We've already given someone else charge of our lives. And that's Jesus Christ, the Lord. He's the master. He's the ruler. He's the one to whom we should turn for all decisions of life, for every direction in life. You know, people in many places plot out what they want to get out of life and and they set their targets and their goals and they try to put their pathway toward their goals together. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ already has all of that arranged for us. He knows what He wants to do with our lives. And we're not our own. We've been bought with a price. When we said, Lord Jesus, forgive me a sinner. Come into my life. We were entering into a kingdom and a domain in which we are not to rule. Rather, He is ruling. But what a blessing to put that responsibility in His hands. Knowing He's all wise and He's all knowing and He's all loving and He's all powerful. What a master, what a Lord to have over our lives. And because of who He is and what He wants to do in our lives and He's the only one who is able to do it, He's the one who should get all of the glory and honor from our lives. Praise the Lord that He uses us. He'll make us instruments in His hands. And we can actually, in the name of the Lord, by the power of His Spirit, in the light of His Word, we can actually be a blessing to other people. How phenomenal that is. But let's not forget where all the credit must go. I mean, if someone says, you know, uh, this blessed me or that blessed me out of your life, well, that's wonderful. But you know, (laughs) the, the bottom line response in one way or another would be an echo of, well, praise be to the Lord. Jesus Christ, our Lord. And notice that little word, our. It gives insight into an aspect of these realities that you don't catch when you just say another truth, Jesus Christ, my Lord. That's a great confession. And if you have never made that confession, this is a great time to do it. The the only greater time than right now was before right now. (laughs) But those opportunities are gone. So this is the greatest opportunity of your life (laughs) to make that confession. Jesus Christ, my Lord. All of these things we have reflected upon concerning this great phrase, Jesus Christ, our Lord. All of these truths, that Jesus is the Savior. He is the anointed King, the Christ of the everlasting kingdom that He wants to invite you into. And He is the Lord. He's the ruler of all the universe. And He's paid a price on the cross to redeem you, to purchase you back to fellowship with God. Out of which we all fell in Adam. And then reconfirmed in our own rebellion and self-indulgence. And I would encourage you, if you've never bowed your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, I would just encourage you to even do it right now. Uh, We'll continue to study for the the saints, that is the brethren, the family of God, uh, which is surely almost everyone that's here, gathers here because... They know the Lord, want to love, worship, honor, and serve Him and get in His Word and be fed and nurtured and edified and equipped. 
We're going to continue to study, but uh, if you would take this step now, if you have never done it, you're going to have a a far better time in the Bible with us. (laughs) You won't be beating your wristwatch (laughs) or saying, why did I ever, ever let them bring me? (laughs) Well, If you're here and you have not trusted the Lord Jesus as your Lord and Savior, all of us would just urge you concerning that. Those of us who have, I think, would all agree, it was the most phenomenal, first wise decision we ever made, and the best decision we will ever make. And we just encourage you, come on in the family of God. Don't be intimidated by us. Past us, there's God Himself. (laughs) We're not some religious elite, believe us. In and of ourselves, sinners saved by grace. Desperate, guilty, far off from God. Had our own agenda. We're rebels, we're in enmity with God. And probably many, many, many of us, including myself, never imagined that the day would come we'd be publicly together boasting about the Lord Jesus Christ. How do you enter in? By relationship with the one who is the Savior, Jesus. A simple prayer, heartfelt, expressing the reality, you see, of your need of Lord Jesus, forgive me a sinner, is fully sufficient. You might say, well, that's just so simple for something so magnificent. Yeah, that's why it's called grace. (laughs) If you want a heavy load of works, pick any other religion in the world. In fact, the Christian faith, it's hard to call it a religion when you list it with what man has come up with. All the religions of the world. Man's efforts to get where he wants to get forever. Bliss. Nirvana. Heaven above. Only this message of the Scriptures. Only the message of Jesus Christ the Lord. Only that reality has a kingdom where the King Himself is God and He comes from glory to rescue us and take us home with Him. (laughs) Nothing like it. Jesus Christ is Lord. This passage adds, our Lord. Jesus Christ, our Lord. He's not just my Lord individually, though each of us have a glorious blessing in confessing that. He's also the Lord and Master of us in a corporate sense. Corporate meaning a body, a group. Jesus Christ, our Lord. He's the Lord and Master of all of His children in common. We share this reality together. That's a huge issue. That's why at your fellowship time, it ignites here as you gather together. We don't have to have, uh, what do they call them, icebreakers? This is not a frozen kingdom, thank you. (laughs) We don't need icebreakers. We just need little plugged up dam removers. You know, like the work of the Spirit saying, just go ahead and love that person, you know. And whoosh, (laughs) The realities of the kingdom of heaven just ignite in a three-minute conversation even. It's also why it's uh, kind of hard to, to uh, turn off that tap and come back and focus on the Word together because it's so precious. It's so real, you know. It's not just a, a human buzz. It's like if you listen carefully Spiritually speaking, you can hear the kingdom of heaven as the saints just share their hearts with each other and ask, how are you doing? And, and praise the Lord, here's what he did. And, and uh, 
How about that thing we were praying about? Well, here's what God's done. You know, here's another thing. It, it's life from the Lord. And we share that together, see. This is not an uh, isolationistic religion. We're not looking for a monastery to go off and hide in and not be heard by anyone. Quite the contrary, really. Though certainly moments of solitude, you can validate in the Word and your own heart longs for them at times. But we share this together. Jesus Christ, our Lord. He's the Lord and Master, not only of each of us, but of all of us as a group. Whether that group is the whole body of Christ worldwide, I like to think about that group. Sometimes the world looks on the church, it must look like it's all chopped up in little pieces. It's, it's not a steak, it's a hamburger, you know. <laughs> it's just chopped up and chopped up and chopped up. But you can get past all of that in just one confession of the heart, you know. Lord, we who are many are one body in Christ. <laughs> you believe that, you can just enjoy the reality that it's Jesus Christ, our Lord, from here around the globe. Sometimes folks call in on the radio and say, you know, uh, which is the best denomination? Why are there so many denominations? Or aren't all denominations a sin and things like that? Not if your heart says and believes and embraces and behaves like this. Romans 12, 1 Corinthians. We who are many we Christians, are, right now, already, one body in Christ. Well, what about all those labels? Well, it helps us find each other, maybe, you know. (laughs) But it doesn't make us some elite group above and beyond anyone else. Jesus Christ, our Lord. He's the Lord over all of us together, the whole body of Christ. He's the Lord over individual marriages and families, husbands and wives, children, grandchildren. He is the Lord over campuses. He's the Lord over ministries and churches. He's our Lord. It adds a magnificent aspect to this great phrase, Jesus Christ, the Lord. He's our Lord. So, as Lord and Master, His will should prevail in our lives together. Not just individually, but together. Covering how we relate to each other, how we treat each other. In what areas and arenas we include each other in in action or concern or burden or prayer or cooperative venture. He is Jesus Christ our Lord. And He is the Lord and Master who wants to work among us and between us. Those who stay in isolation from the body of Christ do not know the wonders packed into that one little word, our. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Well, with just those few moments of reflection on that great phrase, Jesus Christ, our Lord, let's consider right here in the passage some of the wondrous blessings related to this glorious phrase, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Blessings that come to us because we know this one, Jesus Christ, as our Lord. Sometimes we overlook how rich we are in Christ when we're distracted by the lack or need or our lack of wealth in earthly terms. Here's one, verse 2. We are sanctified, called to be saints. To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. Boy, there's a shocker but an encourager. We're the church of God. 
We're believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Now we can be called saints. Sanctified means set apart for. We are set apart for God now through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we can rightly call each other saints. It's one of the great descriptive terms of Christians. In fact, it's used often in the New Testament, saints. It's used more than the common word that's used, which is what? Christian, commonly among the believers. Christian is often the most used term to describe our status. Uh, You can only find that like three times in the New Testament. But you can find saints all kinds of places and times. We're set apart now from the world, the flesh, the devil and self. We now belong to God. That, That makes us saints. Being a saint doesn't mean that we're perfect in every word and deed and attitude. It means we're set apart. We belong to God. We are holy in Christ by His work on our behalf. What a blessing. If, if someone called us sinner, you know, we maybe wouldn't even struggle with that. Yeah, you got me. <laughs> yeah, you know me. But someone says, how is it? How do you like being a saint? You know, we're thinking, me? <laughs> yeah. We who deserve to be called nothing but sinners. We're now set apart in Christ Jesus unto God. And it's right. God calls us saints. And we can call one another the same. To our blessing and His glory. Here's another one in verse 2. We can call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Called to be saints with all who in every place call in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. This group of saints as well as that other group of saints. We all who call upon the name of the Lord in every place. Boy, this is, this is a huge thing. For us to press on as believers, to grow, to be protected by the Lord to develop in wisdom and maturity and fruitfulness. We need to do that with those who call upon the Lord in every place. You know, when people move and change geography, they need to be sure that there is a real, vibrant option there to identify with another part of the body of Christ. We need each other. We're sheep. You don't send a little lamb or even a mature sheep out in a field of wolves on their own. And this whole world is a field of wolves. Have you watched the news lately? It's astounding. One story after another. Well, the thief and his wolves struck again, you know. And you can track it out in the business world, in the military world, in the political realm. I mean, this is a field of wolves and we're sheep. But what a blessing, what a privilege. We can go through our pilgrim trek down here on earth, calling upon the name of the Lord and do it with those who do the same thing. Well, that's the way sheep should live. Because really, this is all the sheep staying together, calling on the name of the Good Shepherd. No problem for sheep to make it in a world like this if they stick close to one another and through that are reminding one another, let's just keep calling on the name of the Lord. And think of that. Think of the names we've called on through our lives. Some a shame, some an insult to God, some a foolish decision on our behalf. But now, in Christ Jesus, we can call on the name of the Lord. We can actually cry out to the true and living God any place we are every day of our lives. And He's right there to hear our cry. Because we're included among those who truly know what it means to say. He's Jesus Christ 
our Lord. And then uh, verse 3 and 4. Grace. The grace of God has been given to us. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus. What a phenomenal treasure we have in the grace of God. Now that our confession is Jesus Christ our Lord, we have grace abundant. I commend to you the study of that great truth, grace. It's one of those that you can commit a lifetime to and just keep realizing the more you learn how much you underestimated the magnitude of the grace of God. Yes, we're saved by grace. Ephesians 2. For grace is the means. Saved by grace through faith. Grace. The undeserved work of God on our behalf. Bringing to us that which we could never deserve or earn or manufacture or replace with anything else. And that's how we start out with God. Lord, by your grace, forgive my sins. Thank you. By your grace, you died on the cross for my sins. Then as you get into the word of God as a born again child of God, uh, watch for it. If you're just somewhat new in the Lord or new in getting really into the word, watch for the grace of God as you read the word of God. You're going to be amazed. It's everywhere. And it was not just about how to start out with God. It's how to go on with God. 2 Peter 3.18 But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The grace of God. The manifold grace of God. Comes from the God of all grace. It is beyond measure. God uh, caught my attention. Oh, 30 plus, nearly 35 years ago on this great subject, uh, having been saved 41 years ago, uh, the Lord caught my attention on it decades ago. And I must say, I'm still seeing that it's greater than I previously thought. It's just permeating the pages of Scripture. And all of that is ours to draw upon. How do you draw upon riches that you don't deserve that only come from God? You seek Him. You trust in Him. You ask for what's needed from Him. You know, you turn to Jesus Christ, our Lord. He's the God of all grace. Verse 5, we are enriched by Him. That you were enriched in everything by Him, in all utterance and all knowledge. Oh, the richness that is ours in Christ. You know, people devote, many people, many, many people, maybe you could say most people, devote much of their life to the pursuit of riches. Even those who never ever get anything but a minus quantity of them. There are many people who are in major debt and have been most of their lives. But still, the dream of their soul is to accumulate earthly riches. Now, God has given riches to many, Abraham and others, many who have followed him, but uh, you can't serve two masters. You can't live for riches and live for God. You can live for God and he might add riches, but you can't live for both. But here's the truth. Those who just live in and for and with Christ They have already been enriched in everything by Him. The things that matter. The everlasting things. Love and joy and peace. And heavenly purpose. Friendship with God. Fellowship with God. These things. We're enriched in these things. They're ours. These things are our realm to walk in, to grow in, to traffic in, to communicate in. And to share and bless others with. We are enriched by him. When we're able to say he's Jesus Christ our Lord. Then verse 6. Oh this is a great one. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. 
We who can say truly, Jesus Christ our Lord, we can have the testimony of Christ confirmed in us. It's one thing to say, Jesus Christ is my Lord. It's another thing when other people look and watch and say, Wow, Jesus Christ is your Lord, isn't He? (laughs) What's the difference? Well, one is our own personal testimony, and praise the Lord for that. If we have bowed before the Lord Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we can make that testimony, and we should. Jesus Christ is my Lord. But when others say that, what's added? A confirmation. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. What a blessing that is. In our own lives, when when others look on and say, I see the Lord at work in your life. In fact, by the way, that's the way true Christian living is supposed to develop. In the religions of man, it's man striving to accomplish something in the sight of God. In this kingdom of heaven, this unique one and only kingdom of God, where Jesus Christ is Lord, where He rules that kingdom, It's not us trying to manufacture something for Him. It's He comes to dwell in our hearts and lives. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Ephesians 3, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. And from the core of our being, where He resides by the work of His Holy Spirit, He wants to work in us, changing us, and let that flow out through us. You know, like Jesus said, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, you know. And you think the way the mouths of the world speak. (laughs) And then if they get embarrassed in the way they speak and they want to change it, they've got a program that's kind of somewhere up here by their lips, you know. (laughs) that uh, All this stuff's going on down there, but I better not say it. There's the boss, I better not say what I'm thinking, you know. But in the kingdom of heaven, the Lord is changing us from the inside out. And Jesus said, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. We just say, Lord, touch my heart, change my heart, fill my heart with love and joy and peace and righteousness and goodness and kindness. Then we won't have to be guarding our lips everywhere we go. Jesus said, Implied, guard your heart. Proverbs says, guard your heart diligently, for from it flow the issues of life. So the Lord wants to dwell in our hearts, work in and through our lives, and there will be confirmation all around. People will see the Lord in us. And of course, that's to their blessing and to His glory. And then verse 7 We are gifted to serve Him. So that you come short in no gift. You know, to serve the living God, the living God gives us spiritual gifts. You can find them in 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 4, Romans 12, a lot of places in Scripture. 1 Peter 4, uh, many mentions of spiritual gifts. Isn't God good? He doesn't say, equip yourself, uh, come up with something by which you can serve me. He saves our souls, gives us eternal life, comes to dwell in us, then gives us these special enablements. Uh, They're actually called charismata, from which we get charismatic. But uh, the, the, the core word of that is charis, grace. Spiritual gifts are gifts of grace, specialized arenas of God's grace at work in and through us. You know, you might be serving the Lord in a certain area and then they say, how do you do that like that? You know, and you stop back and think, well, I guess God has just called me to it and has gifted me in it and must be working through it. What else can I say? You know, 
I know when I stand to teach and preach the Word of God and think of where I started without Christ and even kind of, you know, uh, making fun of a lot of preachers because I was, you know, uh, too sharp and worldly. I'm talking about with my worldly high school and university buddies. And think, wow, who would ever have dreamed that I would stand and teach the Word of God? Well, only God, you know. If we went one after another, it would be amazing how many of us are doing things for the glory of God in the name of the Lord that we couldn't even have dreamed we would. Back at the beginning, or let's say even before the beginning, (laughs) before the days of Christ, He gifts us to serve Him, and that unto His return. Verse 7, waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Waiting for the revealing of, of our Lord Jesus Christ. For those who can truly say, Jesus Christ our Lord, and they're in the Word of God hearing from the Lord, about the Lord and His ways and His plans and His purposes and His timetable, they notice, ooh, He came once, He promised to come again. And it stirs in your heart a desire. And you look at the chaos in the world, the danger in the world, the devastation in the world, and you couple that with the growing portrait of Christ that is being drawn in our hearts and minds by the Holy Spirit through the Word of God as we study it. You see the majesty of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see the bankruptcy of the world. Then you see the promise that He's going to come back. And where does it lead you? Waiting for, yearning for, eagerly interested in the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. You end up praying like the Bible ends. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. You know, if you you love someone, you know someone, And they're gone away, and yet they may be back someday. You yearn for what? To be with them again. So it is with the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, He dwells within our hearts, and what wonderful fellowship from here to glory. But the fullness of this great salvation is that we someday shall see Him as He is. It's one thing to look at a picture and we have a glorious portrait in the Word of Christ. It's another thing to stand before someone, put your arms around their neck, and greet one another with a holy kiss. They're two different things. And you can even see in the Scriptures, Paul yearning to go see the saints at Rome and telling them about it, asking them to pray for it. Listen, we have something like that but way bigger. The Lord is coming back. And the blessed hope of our lives is that we shall soon, perhaps, see Him as He is. This one who is Jesus Christ, our Lord. you imagine confessing that truth with Him visibly present? Well, I think probably our first step will be to the ground, you know. <laughs> but that'll be a great place to be. I'm ready to be on my face before the resurrected, glorified, ascended Christ. And I think in your heart you probably are too. Well, this is one of the great blessings that are ours, those of us who can say, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And then, last blessing here, verse 8, presented blameless. This is staggering. Who will also conform you to the end? Conform you, change you, shape you. That you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Can you imagine that blessing? Standing before the Lord and not have thunderbolts of condemnation and accusation thrown at you. But standing there blameless before the Lord. No one to stand and accuse. And for those of us, I mean, any one of us who's honest can say, why, I could be blamed for all kinds of things. (laughs) 
And we probably have been along the way. But there's a day if we seek Jesus Christ, our Lord, and His pleasure and His work in our lives, and He comes back for us, He'll just present us before Himself blameless. And anyone who wants to raise an accusation covered in the cross, covered by the blood, case closed, next. What a blessing that will be for us. But as we conclude, maybe just for two minutes, we want to look at that third thing. We looked at, number one, each aspect of this glorious phrase, Jesus Christ our Lord. We've considered some of the wondrous blessings related to that glorious phrase when we can confess it. Third and last, what these wondrous blessings depend upon. And it's more good news. Verse 9. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. How are we going to participate in all of these great blessings that accompany the truths of Jesus Christ our Lord? We're going to rely upon the faithfulness of God. God is the faithful one who called us into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. These blessings are ours anchored in the reliability of God. He's the one who called us into these things that are all found in our relationship with Jesus Christ our Lord. He called us into these things. He is going to be faithful to reveal them to us, demonstrate them to us, and through us. We're called into fellowship with His Son. It's the word koinonia. It could be called partnership. We now have a rightful access to these things just through our relationship with Jesus Christ our Lord. Our faithful God has called us to come and share fully in these things. That's what koinonia means. Share fully in. God's invited us to this and He's faithful to respond in all of these ways for those who fellowship day by day with His Son, commune with His Son, get to know His Son. All of these can be our daily hope, our daily portion, our daily opportunity, our daily provision. How can these things be made real in us now? Just depend upon God's dependability. To put it another way, just have faith in God's faithfulness. Oh, but my faith is so meager. Yeah, but the one you're asked to trust is so magnificent. (laughs) Don't get trapped in the aberrant theology of the day where you have faith in your faith. I'm going to believe, I'm going to believe. Pump, pump, pump. I'm going to believe, I'm going to (laughs) believe. Okay, I'm ready to believe. No. With that little grain of mustard seed faith you have, just look at the magnificence of the one who gives us all these things. A little bit of faith exercised in a glorious Lord will bring great manifestations of these realities every time we trust Him. In other words, let's put our faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord. He's faithful. Seek Jesus Christ our Lord, not things of self, not things of the earth. Let's yield to His will, not stubbornly hold on to ours. Let's cry out for the fullness of His Spirit, not striving in our flesh. Let's rejoice in His ownership. Let's ask Him to pour out His grace upon us instead of our will, our flesh, our strength. You know what we'll find? We'll find God is faithful. Let's pray together. Lord, we do thank you so much that we can confess Jesus Christ is our Lord. And Lord, we thank you for the riches that are ours in him. We thank you that again we see the kingdom of heaven is a grand relationship, not a rigorous religious trip. 
So, Lord, we pray by your Holy Spirit, you'll bring to our remembrance these great realities of who you are and what you have for us. And we'll walk in humble dependence, feeding on your word, trusting in you day by day. Lord, manifest your realities in and through our hearts and lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.